member for St. Albert Edmund. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to speak on Bill C-31, legislation styled as an act respecting cost of living relief measures. I'd emphasize styled as an act respecting cost of living relief measures because the measures put forward in this bill can at best be described as half measures and band-aid solutions that fail to address the root causes of the cost of living crisis faced by everyday Canadians. This bill offers measures throwing some money here, throwing some money there, all in a desperate effort by a desperate government to make it appear that it is doing something, anything, to address the cost of living crisis, a crisis of this Liberal government's own making. I have to say it is a bit ironic that even though this bill is styled as legislation to address the cost of living crisis, this bill will in fact exacerbate the cost of living crisis. It will do so because it comes with a price tag of several billion dollars. Several billion dollars that will be borrowed, that will pour fuel on the inflationary fire that is at the heart of Canada's cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis cannot be understated. It is happening, it is real, and Canadians are hurting like never before. Inflation is at a 40-year high. It hit 8.1 percent in June. Inflation for essentials such as food is even higher. Grocery prices are increasing at a faster rate than we've seen in 40 years, with food inflation hitting 10.8 percent. When one looks at some dietary essentials, prices have gone up even more. Fresh fruit up 13.2 percent, eggs up 10.9 percent, bread up 17.6 percent, pasta up 32 percent, and I could go on. The average family of four is now spending $1,200 more this year over last for groceries. $1,200 more this year over last just to put food on the table. And so while members opposite and their uh, coalition partner in the NDP will undoubtedly pat themselves on the back for handing out $500 rent checks, checks that, by the way, most renters won't even qualify for. That is a mere fraction of the increased costs that Canadians are paying just to put food on the table. It underscores the severity of the cost of living crisis and the empty response on the part of this government in tackling it. How did we get into this mess in the first place, one might ask? Well, undoubtedly there are a number of factors, but perhaps the biggest factor is this government's reckless fiscal policies, this government's out-of-control spending. Never in Canadian history have we had a government that has spent more, borrowed more, and added more debt. To put it in some context, in the past seven years, this Prime Minister has accumulated more debt than all of the debt accumulate, accumulated in the 148 years of Canada's history leading up to the election of this government. 
This Prime Minister has added more debt than all previous Prime Ministers combined. Madam Speaker, that is staggering. It, it demonstrates the total lack of prudence, the complete recklessness on the part of this government that has now resulted in this cost of living crisis with 40 year high inflation. Now, Madam Speaker, the government said, don't worry, we can spend and spend some more because interest rates are low. Until they're not, uh, we saw the highest increase in interest rates in a quarter century. The summer in interest rates are uh, undoubtedly going to go up even further. Uh, the Liberals say, well, uh, we had no choice because of COVID. Except, Madam Speaker, when one looks at the facts, uh, this government can't hide behind COVID as an excuse for their out-of-control spending. Let's look at some of those facts. Uh, to begin with, this government added $100 billion in debt in its first five years in office, before COVID hit. In other words, this government added more debt during the good times, indeed, more debt than any government had accumulated during that period of time. Leaving the cupboard there. Uh, of the half a trillion dollars in new spending that we have seen over uh, the past two years, this fire hose of spending, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has determined that more than 40 percent of that is unrelated to COVID. So they say it's because of COVID and yet hundreds of billions of dollars of the half a trillion dollars of new spending, according to the PBO, is unrelated to COVID. Uh, then, in January, the Parliamentary Budget Officer said that the stimulus spending uh, was not serving its intended purpose anymore. And the PBO effectively called on the government to stop the new spending. What was this government's response to the Parliamentary Budget Officer? To do exactly the opposite. Uh, this government did the only thing this government knows how to do, and that is to spend other people's money. Uh, with $71 billion of new spending, uh, with Bill C-8, uh, $60 billion in new spending, with Budget 22, and now billions of more dollars with this inflationary spending bill. To pay for it all, uh, this government, through the Bank of Canada, uh, did something that no other government has done before, and that is uh, quantitative easing. In other words, the printing of money. And so, after all of the spending, all of the debt, and all of the money printing, there has been a cost. And it is the cost of 40-year high inflation. The more that this government spends, the more the cost of living goes up. The more that this government spends, the costlier it is for Canadians to purchase goods, Canadians taking less in, in their paycheck, their purchasing power being diminished, all because of this government's reckless fiscal policies. And so, Madam Speaker, I, I, although we, we find ourselves in this position, of uh, 40-year high inflation fueled by this government's reckless spending, uh, one must say that it ought not have been a surprise to this government that they would find themselves in this place. Uh, after all, uh, it, it was quite foreseeable that when you uh, have more money chasing fewer goods, 
you're going to get inflation. It's called Economics 101. Uh, the leader of the official opposition, when he was the shadow minister of finance, called on this government to monitor inflation. He predicted that if the government didn't get spending under control, we would be seeing inflation. Uh, what was the response from the finance minister and the prime minister? It was to completely ignore uh, the leader of the opposition. Uh, they said, don't worry about inflation. If anything, we, we must be concerned about deflation. Well, how wrong they were. But, uh, Madam Speaker, I guess it is a consequence of having a Prime Minister who has admitted that he doesn't think much about monetary policy. Perhaps if he thought a little bit about monetary policy, we wouldn't find ourselves as a country in this fiscal mess and the consequent cost of living crisis that everyday Canadians are enduring. Now, Madam Speaker, if this government was serious about addressing the cost of living crisis, uh, it wouldn't be doing what it is doing, but, but that's what it's doing. It's doubling down on the same failed approach with even more spending that got us into this mess in the first place. What this government should be doing is heeding the advice of the leader of the opposition by reining in spending, by restoring a fiscally responsible policy, a sound monetary policy, by finding savings and rooting out waste in government. And Madam Speaker, there is no shortage of waste to root out. If this Prime Minister was serious about tackling the cost of living crisis, which begins with tackling the out-of-control spending of this government, this Prime Minister would be doing what the Leader of the Opposition has called on this government to do, to introduce legislation such as pay-as-you-go, whereby government must find a dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending. Now, some Liberals might scoff at the notion of pay-go legislation, but it's worked. It's worked in the largest democracy and the largest economy in the world, uh, that of the United States. Uh, more than 20 years ago, a Republican Congress passed and a Democratic President, Bill Clinton, signed into law pay-go legislation. What was the result? A balanced budget for the first time in decades, and the United States paid down more than $400 billion of debt. But, Madam Speaker, don't expect this government to implement measures such as that. Don't expect them to rein in spending. Don't expect them to uh, reflect on their failed policies and reverse course, because on issue after issue, no, this government's measure of success, as they measure their success, is based upon how much they have spent. Uh, we see this with respect to housing. Uh, this government has spent billions of dollars, more than $40 billion in housing. Uh, billions of more was announced in Budget 22. What have been the results? Well, uh, to begin with, the average Canadian is now paying roughly half of their monthly paycheck to cover their monthly housing costs. When this government came to office, the average Canadian was paying roughly 32 percent of their paycheck. They're now paying 50 percent of their paycheck. Housing prices have doubled. They've gone up 52 percent in just 
the past two years. We have the most land in the G7, and yet we have the fewest houses in the G7 on a per capita basis. So the Liberals can pat themselves on the back for spending all of this money in housing, but when you look at the results, we've got the fewest houses in the G7 among the highest prices that have doubled under this government's watch, and now Canadians are paying half of their paycheck just to put a roof over their head. I would call that, Madam Speaker, a policy of failure. Canadians certainly haven't gotten good value for all of that money that went out the door. Uh, Madam Speaker, it is why I say if this government was serious about tackling housing affordability, they again would be turning to the Leader of the Opposition, who has put forward a comprehensive plan to make housing more affordable so that Canadians can purchase a home or, or rent a unit uh, by, among other things, tackling supply, by increasing supply, uh, by selling off a portion of the federal government's real estate portfolio for, to build more housing units, by uh, incentivizing municipalities to allow more houses to be built, including tying federal infrastructure dollars uh, to municipalities based upon new units built. Uh, these are reasonable solutions to try to address a very real problem that is impacting so many Canadians. What is this government's solution, Madam Speaker? Well, uh, to hand out a $500 rent check. That's their solution. A $500 rent check that doesn't even cover one week's rent in most Canadian cities. Not only that, six out of ten renters, more than six out of ten renters, won't even qualify for the check. And those that do will see whatever short term benefit of that $500 eviscerated with the Liberals' inflation, rising interest rates, and most significantly, planned Liberal tax hikes in the new year. That's right, at a time when Canadians are paying more in taxes than in housing, transportation, food and clothing combined, at a time when Canadians are faced with 40-year high inflation, this Liberal government has suddenly decided it's a good time to increase payroll taxes and triple the mother of all taxes, the tax on everything, the hated carbon tax, that, by the way, is contributing to inflation. Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker, it, it demonstrates that this government isn't serious about addressing affordability. If they were, as a, as a starting point, they would again heed the advice of the Leader of the Opposition and cancelled the planned tax hikes. But for not, and so here you have a government that is, with one hand, handing out some checks to some Canadians only to take whatever benefit away with the other hand in the way of planned Liberal tax hikes. This legislation may be styled as an act respecting cost of living relief measures, but, Madam Speaker, this is not a serious plan to address the cost of living. It is more Liberal smoke and mirrors. It is an empty PR exercise in the absence of a real plan, and it is why I will be opposing the bill. Yeah, yeah, Thank you, yeah. Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader.
Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, if you listen to the Conservatives, you would think that the Liberal government of Canada is causing rapid inflation around the world. That all the problems, you know, whether it's the pandemic or it's the war in Europe, has no, no factor in terms of what's happening in Canada. The reality is quite different. The reality is that Canada, yes, we're concerned about inflation, as we should be. But when you compare us to the United States, to the European Union, to England, our inflation rate is less. When you take a look, Madam Speaker, in terms of the legislation we're actually debating today, it's about providing dental care for kids under the age of 12. You wouldn't have known that if you were listening to the member speaking on the legislation, uh, Madam Speaker. My question to the member is, does the member not see the value of providing uh, 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 dental care for children under the age of 12? Does he not believe that the constituents, the children that he represents, would benefit with that, uh, with that program that's being proposed in the legislation today? Honourable Member for St. Edmund, St. Albert Edmonton. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would note that nine out of ten provinces already have dental plans and supports for uh, children, and so in that respect, this is a duplicative measure. But the Honourable Member says, uh, talks about the reality uh, of what is happening in Canada. The reality of what is happening in Canada is that we have 40-year high inflation and it is being fueled by this government's out-of-control spending. Uh, the member is quite right. Canada isn't alone. Other countries also have inflation. Why do they have inflation? Because they've pursued the very same policies yeah. as this government. If you pursue the same reckless policies, you're going to get the same reckless results. The, the member, the parliamentary secretary, cited the United States. Well, they Madam Speaker, our colleague has often made very structured speeches. I understand that they're against C-31. I understand them somewhat because it's a badly written bill. But as they seem to want the federal government to barely exist at all, how Does the new position of the Conservative Party to be against transfers, including increased health transfers to provinces, to the equivalent of 35 percent of costs? Are they against the requests of Quebec and all the provinces? The Honourable Member for St. Albert. Well, well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And the Honourable Member for Mirabel is quite right that the provinces, the premiers, have called on the federal government to increase health transfers to the provinces. Uh, what has been the response of the Prime Minister? He refuses to even sit down with the Premiers. And uh, what has he come up with? He comes up uh, with this bill uh, instead of uh, addressing uh, the, the needs of the provinces. And yes, we do have deficiencies in our health care system that need to be addressed. Those deficiencies were exposed during COVID. And so what is required is federal leadership working collaboratively with the provinces. And that starts with sitting down with the premiers, something this prime minister has failed to do. Here, here. Questions and comments. The honorable member for London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I just want to be very clear um, on this point that, that CPP and EI are not taxes. These are social programs. They are part of a social safety net that ultimately helps workers. And ultimately what the, the opposition party uh, is consistently saying is that these are taxes. However, these are deductions that help people. And yes, it is my time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, what the, the Conservatives are, are ultimately saying is that they want to save workers on average about $11 a month by cutting their pensions and cutting EI. And what this would actually save corporations are billions. And they're not saying that to people. They're trying to sell them on something that isn't true. And ultimately, we are trying, through the government and our work with the government, to create longer, um, long-lasting, uh, equity-driven social programs like dental care. So I would ask the member why he doesn't believe, I mean, ultimately, there is a difference. But ultimately, they're, ca they're calling for tax cuts 
that will benefit a very small group of people, especially, and why he would ask for that now, especially when we see in the UK that this is clearly not working. This is clearly not the way to... I have to give the Honourable Member the time to answer uh, the Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmund. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I want to thank the Member uh, for London, Fanshawe. Uh, she says that uh, these are not tax hikes in terms of payroll tax hikes, but the Member for Papineau, her leader, said that they were. Uh, the Government of Canada website says they are. And here's the reality for everyday Canadians. These payroll tax hikes are going to mean that the average person is going to take less home in their paycheck. And they're going to p take even <coughs> less home in the new year when on top of the payroll tax hikes, this government, with the backing of the member for London, Fanshawe, and the NDP, is going to set to triple the carbon tax policy of the NDP has, is one of taking more money out of the pockets of Canadians, making life, life less affordable. Our position is to put more money back in the hands of Canadians by cutting taxes, and that's a very different approach indeed. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. St. Albert Edmonton has been interested in finding common ground in this chamber. In fact, just last week he proposed and, and sponsored a bill from the Senate that was passed here unanimously. So in this spirit, when he speaks about the cost of housing, he and I agree that much more needs to be done to address the increased aff unaffordability. One solution I'm hoping he could comment on is the rules of the market that currently favor corporate investors like real estate investment trusts. Two questions. Does he agree that home should be for people to live in and not commodities for investors to trade? And is he not similarly concerned that more needs to be done to tilt the market back towards regular Canadians, young people, for example, looking to even afford renting housing in communities across the country? The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Well, uh, Ma Madam Speaker, the, uh, I want to thank the member for uh, Kitchener for his comments, uh, and I appreciate working collaboratively with him on, on some issues of common ground. Uh, but the root of the problem that the member speaks of goes back to the half a trillion dollars that this government pumped out over the past two years. Exactly. Money that went into the mortgage and finance systems that was borrowed to investors who bought up properties, bid up prices, and as a consequence, housing prices have gone up 52%. It's because of that policy. Here, here. For Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I guess I just would like to ask the member the question of my colleague. You know, we used to, we just heard a comment from the NDP that it uh, almost reflected that the taxpayer were kind of those, just like those big bad corporations, they were the bad guys. And I'd just like the member to reflect on pay, payroll taxes come out of, in essence, every, every tax dollar comes out of the back of a taxpayer's pocket. Can the member just answer and reflect on where the money actually comes from for these payroll taxes? For St. Albert Edmonton. Yeah, well, Madam Speaker, it comes from the earnings of Canadians. And uh, they're going to be taking home less in January, again, thanks to the Liberal and NDP planned payroll tax hikes and the tripling, the tripling of the carbon tax. It, you couldn't come up with a worse policy at a time of this cost of living crisis in the face of 40 year high inflation. By the way, uh, as the one, uh, one last question, the Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary, the Leader of a Government in the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You know, I, I listened with interest when the member was talking about the price on pollution, the carbon tax, uh, as though it's something that, uh, you know, is brand new. The reality is, is that this party has run three elections uh, on uh, having a price on pollution. As a matter of fact, that member, under the Conservative banner, also ran uh, in favour of a price on pollution in the last election in 2021. Can he explain to the House why he's so critical of a plan that he ran on just one year ago? 
The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton, 15 Madam seconds. Madam Speaker, the parliamentary, parliamentary Secretary is simply wrong. I have always opposed the carbon tax. The Conservative Party has always opposed the carbon tax and will scrap the carbon tax if we're elected. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable